Okay, so we're here at the NC Fit Collective um, in where are we? Campbell, California. Campbell. Campbell, California. I'm here with Dr. Kelly Starrett, uh, original co-founder, founder of Mobility Wad, now Ready State. That's it. Okay. So you were just giving a talk to a lot of the gym owners that are here for this summit, and you were kind of talking a lot about like the front lines of health and what they're really doing and how they're one of the touch points of athletes and their ability to create that environment <coughs> system. I, something that struck me when you were talking was like, I came into mobility for a performance. I started you know, mobilizing and spending time in positions for performance, but I was curious, do you see mobility uh, as more performance related or health related now with the things that you do? I think what's great about asking about does someone have access to their positions and capacities? Are they stiff? Can they, can they achieve a shape? Is that that's a two-sided coin. And what we're always looking at for us is I'm looking for thinking that scales across cohorts, across um, skills and tests and tasks. So if this is the range of motion I should have as a kid and I can't, that's a problem. If this is the range of motion I should have as an Olympic athlete and I can't, that's a problem. Performance, right? But also in there, it turns out, we witness, because we see a lot of people move, that one of the things that I absolutely can control as a coach is the quality of the movement. So I think it gets confusing because everyone's like, everything's mobility. I'm like, ah. you know, everything is movement. The expression of position under real life demands is, is movement, right? So what we're saying is that do you have the mobility to do something? Mm -hmm. what, what really is we've defined it as, and we took a big swing at this 10 years ago, do I have the raw range of motion to get there? And then do I have the technique to express that, the skill to maintain that? And it turns out, for example, if you can't put your arms over your head, you can do it slow, but you can't do it fast. You can do it slow, but you can't do it heavy. You can do it slow, but you can't do it when you're on fire or competing or with dumbbells. Maybe you can't really do it. So it's great, this, we gotta get people going. So moving your hands out on the barbell is a great way to start. But eventually, this is an incomplete position. It's this position that matters. And that's why we train with dumbbells. And that's why we train with kettlebells. And that's why we do handstand push-ups. And that's why we do on the pull-up. So ultimately, it's about making sure that, hey, here's what we think everyone should be able to do. And if we move out of energy systems for a second, yes, you should be competent in across energy systems and theoretically be strong in certain positions. But ultimately, what we're doing is an exercise and we're gonna simplify this, is we're taking a shape, a skill, and then we're gonna challenge it with as many different movements. So the difference between a squat and a deadlift is where you hold the bar and how bent your knee is. Otherwise, it's the same, right? So suddenly I'm like, here, hold this 100 pound sandbag and squat. Is that a deadlift or is that a squat? It's a hip hinge. And then I'm just using my knee and torso position to challenge ultimately the, the capacity of that. So when I put someone under real load and speed and compete, then it's really easy to see if they can do those shapes. Okay, so position is sacrosanct for being a coach. But if someone comes in with pain and says, hurts when I do a push-up, then suddenly I can conjoin those things. Well, I know what the start position is. I know what the finish position is. The easiest thing for me to do is to make sure you actually can do what a human should do. How much shoulder extension do you need? I'm asking you. I don't know. <laughs> you need enough so you don't compensate. Okay. But if Good. all I yeah. value is that you get up and down and you completed a task anyway, imagine driving your car here and all I said was, well, how did the drive go? And you're like, I pr <laughs> But I, I had three accidents, I ran four right. stoplights, right? I hit a curb, but you pr Well, that's a little bit of what we have done. And to the, the credit of the community, when we started this experiment almost 15 years ago, no one was skilled. No one was right. fit. Go back and look at those old games oh videos and stuff. Come on, go, you're kind of like. So now, right, now you know. we get to have a different conversation. Great. I mean, there are dumbbells and kettlebells and, and barbells all over the place. And if you go into any gym, big gym on the country, like even like a Globo gym, you're still going to see all of this stuff there because all of a sudden people are actually doing training. And so that means we get to have the next conversation. And for us, if you're injured, it's because you can't do your job in society. You can't do your job on the team. You can't. You, there's a bone sticking out of your leg. You can't occupy your role. Everything else is an incident. And the first thing that I can do is say, well, are you set up for your environmental health? Well, let's talk about sleep and stress and nutrition. Who does that? We do. We're coaches. This is the gym, right? So it's always been about performance and about re resolution of, per of position. But suddenly now we're like, hey, we can scale this down and talk about your injury or pain.
So now most, like a lot of the clients that come to you specifically, like what, and this probably has changed in trends in this world, or maybe it hasn't, but what are they now coming to you as being like, this is one goal that I have, this is either a mobility goal or a movement goal or a pain-free goal. What is one of the most common things that you guys, people come and approach you with now as like a goal for them? Well, you know, um, our training language, which is CrossFit based, right? That's, that's the root language. Whether you're tweaking it, that's my root language. It will always be. Um, that means you have to be competent across all these skills. And um, what we're seeing is that people still don't, can't express competency in a skill because they don't have access to the range of motion. It's not because of the programming, it's not because of the training, it's not because they're strong enough. They're just, they're not making that clean because they don't have any internal rotation and they can't receive the clean. Right, and so I, I think what ends up happening is, if you start, for example, the opens going on, watch people move. So I just watched Tia and uh, Car Pierce, and I'll, I have a uh, video come up. But you can see how cleanly they can hinge with zero deflection in their spine. That's very efficient. Well, it turns out you should be able to have. If you land your back, you should lift your one of your legs up to 90 degrees. You should be able to keep a flat back and bend over and grab a barbell. And if you can't. You don't have access to your shape and positions. So one of the things that we can always come do is refine positions, refine shapes. And the thing that we're seeing is that people are now talking, people are starting to be fit. They're starting to have big work engines, which means we get to have the next conversation, a little bit nuanced in position. And hey, people are saying, hey, I can't access this. Well, because it's a, it's a 5% problem, not a, you're missing 50% yeah. of your range of motion. That's why you round your back every time you pick a barbell off the ground. Right. I'm not saying that that's dangerous. I'm saying that's grossly inefficient. Yeah. Okay. Now, okay. So you see a lot of coaches. You travel the world. You work with a lot. You, you. I'm sure you train coaches. You work with your own coaches on staff. You've been to a lot of different gyms. Coaches are my jam. Coaches are your jam. So, what is one thing that you constantly hear, coached, taught, or discussed in the CrossFit broader CrossFit community? That's like, stop telling your athletes that because that doesn't work. Like what is one of those yeah. common misconceptions in mob- mobilization that you just are like, that we gotta get, we gotta stop teaching our athletes coming in the door this because it does nothing. We want to make sure that people have clear windows of or clear bookends, rather that's a better word, for what is this normative range of motion, what are the skills. So one of the things that happens is that if I if I ask people, well, what are the movements you think everyone should be able to do in your gym? They can't answer that question, right? And I'm like, okay, so what, what is it? Yeah, everyone should thrust are great. Well, what are the components to the thrust that you, you're not even looking at those things. You're just like, well, we did thrusters, squat. right? And the pro- most important thing to do is to thruster first. But your thruster may be a quarter squat and a quarter press. That's your thruster today with dumbbells, right? Or you get one dumbbell. Or we're gonna go tempo with a barbell during your thruster. This doesn't mean you get to go as fast as you doesn't, can. You're not doing today. <laughs> well, right, and Fran still may be in this range. So the real question is, What are we teaching? So if we look at all of this as skill development, we've been saying for a long time, practice doesn't make perfect, practice makes permanent. So if you're letting your athletes turn their feet out and collapse their arches every time they get up and down off the ground for burpee, you're confusing patterns that are gonna translate to something else. So you're actually making it a very fit athlete who can't transfer that skill because you've taught them skills that actually don't make them better in the world. So I try to remind everyone, hey, the goal is not to be the best CrossFitter, unless you're a CrossFit athlete. And even then, you're seeing that the efficiency of our best athletes, Matt Frazier, Tia, all of them, they continue to refine, refine, refine. Their positions become more robust. When, when uh, Froning gets tired, his mechanics get better. If you get tired, do your mechanics get better or do they get worse? That's the question here, right? So what we want to see is that there's a real opportunity for us to take what was traditionally GPP, general physical preparedness, and make it now sports preparation training. So look, when we started this thing a million years ago, we weren't very fit. We weren't very strong. We weren't conditioned. We weren't. And now the world has changed. We have Bayes Boot Camp to thank for that, Orange Theory, yeah. CrossFit. I mean, everyone is doing some kind of high intensity exercise. Soul Cycle. Yeah. Unskilled, high physiology, bleed from your eyes, be a worse athlete when you get up. But your cardio will be so good. It doesn't mean it's bad, it just means that you're an incomplete. So what's now is I'm like, hey, we can take that GPP idea, which is I gotta be competent in these shapes across all of these domains when I'm going fast, when I gotta do more than one rep, when I'm breathing hard, when I'm right, going, you know, 
with a dumbbell, with a barbell, right. whether I'm upside down or not, right? Sure. All these ways to challenge position. That person becomes very skilled at applying the principles of movement to any task. So you ask them to do monkey bars in a Spartan race, they're gonna slay it. Ask them to jump and learn a new skill, they're gonna slay it because all they've done is worked on principled movement. The movements become just tools around the, the movement. So what we can do is we can take the GPP and make it sports preparation. By caring that your feet get better, you're gonna be a better cyclist. You're gonna play better soccer. You're gonna be able to jump and land sure. and ski. I mean, if, if, you, if you train like this, when we go skiing, you're gonna have problems. Yeah. If you go on the bike, you're gonna have problems. If you're playing right. soccer, you're gonna have problems. In fact, what I've done is practice shapes that don't translate well for you. But you're so strong and big, I hope you can figure it out. <laughs> so that ship has sailed. Now people are coming in very strong. That means we get to have the next conversation. It doesn't mean the first conversation was wrong, because I try to remind people. I'm like, mm, how much were you overhead squatting 10 years ago? Oh, you didn't overhead squat 10 Zero. years ago. <laughs> oh, there you go. So that's a problem, and now it's changed. Like everyone overhead squats, right? Great. But that was a revolution a decade ago. Yeah. Well, I remember my very first overhead squat ever in CrossFit was 14.2. When it was programmed, oh really? Limit. And and I that was the first time. First time at you were like, what is this? I didn't have the underlying mobility to do it, so I got through the first round. It's like 10, 10, 12, 12. Yeah. So I got through ten. I, I hammered out the the uh, chest bar pull-ups because it was like, thank God I can do something I can do now. And then I came back to the barbell and I I got like six. That was my first. That was only my second cross. There's program. an old video I used to put up all the time. Nicole Carroll at a, at a, I was at. Um, I was teaching level one, it was at Orange County Fire Authority, and Nicole is squatting against the other guy. And this guy is just so big, and he can't put his arms over his head, and Nicole just goes up and down. And you can see it was the first great demonstration of mechanical efficiency as a way of, of being more efficient, more effective, transferring more energy, being, being, you know, being able to have higher endurance. And what you saw was that he could do it a little bit first, and then it, the cost becomes so high. So what's nice about that is then we can not say, it's, hey, it's not overhead squatting, it's the ability to effortlessly achieve the shape and position and organization of your body that's gonna make you a better swimmer and runner. And, and what I do wanna remind people is that the goal originally, particularly in CrossFit, and I'm not gonna speak for everyone because this has been written down, was to go regularly play, learn new sports. And one of the things that we've tried to do in the gym in the last, because, because of the internet, because of the sophistication of coaches, is that we're trying to do everything in the gym. And I don't think we need to do that. I think what we need to do is create, here are the positions and shapes. In an hour, there's plenty of time to work on skill, work on strength, but you don't have to get every rotation, every turn, every plane, everything, go play a sport. And you know, sometimes when people are like, it's all in the front of the plane, you know, they make all this statement that we just go up and down. And I'm like, actually, if I went and skateboarded for 10 minutes or played volleyball or, or Hoover ball, go back to the original CrossFit yeah, Journal, that. Hoover ball, yep. I'm going to get plenty of rotation in there, playing games. So mm -hmm. the intention of this was always to be better in the world, not for bodybuilding. And that's largely what we've become sometimes in some communities. No diss, whatever the reason you're in here is good, but don't forget the idea was to train, respect your time, respect your energy consumption, so you could go out and project that into the world more effectively. Awesome. Not just forever and ever be recursive. Right. Because look, this is an unpopular statement, but I'm gonna say it. All right. This is the morning chaco. It's here. Pull ups and put and dips make a mm, kind of not a great sport. <laughs> dips aren't a great sport. Comma, she should be able to dip like it's your job. Damn right. Can I gamify dips? Damn right. That's what makes it interesting. That's why I'm what, 17 years into my CrossFit experience, 16 years, and I'm not bored. In fact, I'm just understanding more and more the elegance and the simplicity of the program, and I can continue to make, I'm 46 years old, appeared on my deadlift like two months ago. That's awesome. Oh, dude. And I have the biggest set of lungs I've ever had. That's awesome. I wonder how I'm able to go do this because I CrossFit. That's crazy. That's so crazy. So remember why we're doing this in the first yeah. place, right? And the games confuses us, and the games is important because that's my high performance lab. The number of pieces of information we'll be able to pull out working with the top athletes, and we have worked with so many of the top athletes, um, we get information from that. And we, now we know, like, you gotta eat. You, this is how we move, right. this is the most efficiency. And what we often see is that everyone can be even on the first workout, the first two rounds of the workout, yeah. but the person who's more efficient and more effective with, and runs that, that is driving 100 miles an hour but only in third gear, not six gear redlining, right. that person is hard to beat over time. Yeah. And those are the lessons we've learned. So we gotta take all of that and not just make it circus, but make it matter to my kids, make it matter to my parents. I mean, my mother-in-law CrossFit's origin. That's awesome.
Awesome. Well, thank you for spending some time with me. Where can people find you online and check out your stuff? We are at The Ready State. Okay, awesome. At The Ready State, and if you really want to see what's going on, you follow Juliet, right? the, the, the CEO of The Ready State. She's, Very good, awesome. She's the one. Well, thank you for spending some time with me. Absolutely. Appreciate it. Pleasure.